Hello ladies and gentlemen this is Nishant and welcome to another episode of the Nishant Gar show the mission of this show is to spread awareness on mindfulness practices psychology mental health and spirituality my job on the show is to invite world class performers to share the practices to live a fulfilled life today's guest is Deborah Rosman Deborah Rosman PhD is a psychologist president and CEO of Heartmath Inc and Heartmath Pain Company Quantum Intech Inc which oversees strategic alliances and the expansion of Heartmath Technologies internationally. Deborah Rosman is founding executive director of Heartmath Institute and a key spokesperson for Heartmath and the Heartmath system around the world, along with helping develop, oversee and conduct Heartmath training programs since its inception in 1991. She has 30 years of experience as an entrepreneur, business executive, educator and author. In this episode, Deborah discusses about consciousness and calling and purpose heart intelligence transforming stress how to increase the heart rhythm coherence techniques and much more keep listening debra welcome to the show well thank you so much for inviting me i'm delighted to be of service and to be here today I am glad, super glad as well. Can we start with something? Where did you grow up, and what was your childhood like? Oh, I grew up in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and it was a lovely upbringing. My childhood was very warm, full of love, and very much of an intellectual family as well. And so I had two older brothers. And so that constantly kept me learning and growing. But I do remember. When I was about four years old, sitting on the porch of our house, looking up at the green trees and the blue sky, and wondering, "What's it all about? What am I here for?" And hearing a voice in my head, which was my voice, but it was distinct, saying, "You're here to serve." And that became sort of the lens that I looked at life through for quite some time. But as a four-year-old, I wondered what that meant, and When I went to kindergarten, I thought it meant being a kindergarten teacher because she was serving me and everyone else. And I had the same feeling all the way up to sixth grade. Oh, I'll be a fourth grade teacher, a fifth grade teacher, a sixth grade teacher. And then my worldview expanded when I went to what's called junior high school, <clears throat> and you had seven teachers, and there wasn't that deep heart bond or connection. with any of them and that's when i began to study psychology and ended up eventually studying psychology and theater and went to the university of chicago and then that led me out to studying consciousness studies in california at the university of california at santa cruz and then a lot more on the journey to discover who i was and started eastern and western types of yoga and meditation and a lot more in the journey that led me then to heart math <laughs> thank you for explaining and you talked about you studied consciousness yes well it was interesting when i was at the university of chicago i was studying attitude change theory humanistic psychology was just getting started but so much of the courses were rats and statistics and i knew i wasn't going to learn much about myself or human beings that way what our motivations were what our attitudes were how will we change attitudes to have a healthier happier life get along better <clears throat> so at that time university of california at santa cruz with norman o'brown was offering history of consciousness program and it was offering the ability to be creative put together your own majors and eslin was just starting so that attracted me and i came out here to california and this was i'm aging myself now but that was in the late 60s <laughs> 69 and i thought i thought i had literally died and gone to another planet and <laughs> it was the time when there was the summer of love the year before and every all the hippies and but a lot of love people were really trying to practice love and care and whatever else they were doing and that opened my heart in a way and i got involved in yoga and meditation but history of consciousness ended up being just that history what looking backwards 
And I knew there was something new happening and I was being called to serve what is going to help transform consciousness in the future, now and in the future, my own and the world's. So that's where I began to explore other options that weren't offered in university. Is there a way we can help people finding their calling, finding their purpose? Definitely. And I talk about it in my, our book, uh, HeartMath book called Heart Intelligence, Connecting with the Intuitive Guidance of the Heart. Now, that's not just some mindfulness or spiritual um, ideal. The research at HeartMath and now other places, too, has shown that the heart is really an energetic system. It's not just a blood pump. And it also has its own intrinsic nervous system, a little brain that operates independent of the brain in our head that can sense, learn, feel, and remember. And this is blow away breakthrough because it confirms what ancient traditions have said throughout the world, that the heart is the seat of the soul or the seat of wisdom, or the mind is really in the heart or the higher mind is, or the source of our morality, our conscience, all those things. And what we found in researching the heart at HeartMath and with our associate institutes is that the heart really does send signals to the brain, telling the brain how the body feels, and that the heart is actually, through its electromagnetic field, receiving information like a radio receiver and transmitter of information that's outside of time and space, so intuitive information, or maybe a connection, as I experience, with what we call our larger self, whether you identify that as a being, as a angel, as a soul, as a master, as yourself. There's a frequency in a higher domain outside of time and space that the heart is actually able to tune into to gain intuitive direction and guidance for what would be the highest best for us in the wholeness. And of course it goes through the brain mind, but when the heart brain nervous system are synchronized, we have more access to that intuitive guidance that gives us those promptings or conscience of whether we should go this way or that way or say this or say that. And that becomes a wonderful state of alignment that allows us to live more in flow. And live Are more. there some practices to make this alignment? Yes, that's the heart math is all about that. So you can find your purpose as you listen to and follow your heart. And that's been said forever. You know, and people all know it's important to follow our heart, but we're afraid the heart's going to get us into trouble. <laughs> Always. <laughs> so how do we distinguish the voice of the real heart? from the emotional pulls or desires or from the fears. And that's a lot of the heart math techniques and tools and technology are designed specifically to help us get into that internal alignment and synchronization of heart, brain, and nervous system so that we can begin to learn our own internal signals and increase the signal to noise ratio, have more clear signals of what is appropriate for us, what is our purpose, our blueprint. In your book, Transforming Stress, you talk about two kinds of hearts. So one is physical heart and second is metaphorical heart. So which kind of heart are we talking about right now? You know, what I also talk about in Transforming Stress and in all our books is that there isn't a separation. The terms that Every language has, listen to your heart, follow your heart, go deep into your heart for the answer, put your heart into it, sing with your heart, play with your heart. These are metaphors, but the research is showing they are not metaphors. When we do any of that, we are changing the rhythmic beating pattern of the heart. We are changing the heart rhythm into more of a synchronized, coherent waveform. When we're stressed, frustrated, anxious, worried, depressed, the stressful emotions, that heart rhythm becomes very disorganized, organized, disordered. And it looks about like an earthquake on the graph if we have you hooked up to a heart rhythm monitor. Whereas when we're feeling genuine feelings like love, 
care, compassion, kindness, forgiveness for ourselves or others. When our heart opens in joy and bliss and peace, that heart rhythm pattern becomes really smooth and synchronized and it sends a different signal to the higher cortical centers of the brain that activate compassion and empathy and bigger picture thinking. So it's really a critical breakthrough to understand these so-called metaphors of the heart are actually connected to the biological, physical heart. Are you saying that brain, our brain is listening to our heart? Well, I, yes, in a sense, our heart sends more information to the brain telling the brain what to do than the brain sends to the heart. That was discovered many years ago popular and published in 1990, and it's a paradigm shift. It turns everything upside down. Because most people think that the neck up is where we live, it's who we are. But it really is a distri- distributed system. Heart is our sense of deep who we are, deep sense of beingness. And the brain mind is what we've learned and some of our traits, whether it's from genetic or environmental influences, it shapes our personality and our thinking processes. When we get our heart rhythms into that coherent, synchronized state, the signal the heart sends to the brain is everything's harmonious, we can be creative, open up, and the brain is a pattern matching computer and it will look for familiar patterns. So if anxiety and stress have become our default familiar habits, then the signal the heart sends to the brain is a pattern of anxiety in the heart rhythm. And that affects the amygdala, the emotional processing center, our memories, and it triggers, the brain feels that and triggers protection, the fight, flight, fright, stress response. So you see, the heart is really the master controller of a lot of what happens in the brain. Not everything, but a lot. I would like to ask you, is there any way to increase the heart rhythm coherence? Yes, that's exactly what our heart math, the books you have, gives you some techniques. But the training programs, the heart math experience, which is a beautiful 90-minute film, or you can listen to it in 10-minute sections, gives you some tools, explains a little of the science and what's happening on the planet, the shift the planet needs to make and is making towards awakening the heart. And yeah, all of our programs are certification programs for health professionals called the Heart Math Clinical Certification with techniques that you use for emotional self-regulation our technology, they're all coherence techniques. And the heart math technology, the inner balance or the M wave shows you in real time what's happening in your heart rhythm. It's a pulse sensor that converts your heart rate and heart rate variability and converts heart rate variability into how much coherence or synchronization there is in your heart rhythm. And as you practice the coherence techniques with the technology, you increase your baseline coherence, you accelerate the carryover effect, and you really can manage, transform stress, anxiety, depression, but also that regulation helps you be more poised to make better choices and decisions. We have been using this term coherence a lot of times. Yeah. Could you please explain this term in a more simplistic way for our listeners? Yes, yes. So, Coherence, if you look it up in the dictionary, has a number of definitions, and we've heard it in almost all of us in conversation, saying, well, that's a very coherent way of thinking, or yeah. that's, you know, that's a coherent argument, meaning it's clear, it's, it's orderly, it, it, it's clear, it, it has a clear tra- energetic transfer that's coherent to me. So in physics, coherence means a sine wave, waveform where all the frequencies in that wave are lined up, they're in alignment. And in fact, a coherent heart rhythm is where on a frequency spectrum, there's just one peak at 0.1 hertz. All the frequencies in the heart rhythm are resonating at that frequency. And that happens to be the same frequency, 0.1 hertz, as nature's resonant frequency, as the Earth's magnetic field from the core of the Earth 
is putting out resonances or frequencies that overlap human cardiovascular rhythm frequency. So this is very powerful to realize that coherence occurs at all levels in nature. It occurs at our mental coherence, our emotional coherence. We feel clear emotionally and present. Physical, physiological coherence is when your heart rhythm is in that sine wave. And there's coherence at other levels. Quantum physicists talk about quantum coherence. So the universe is coherently organized, even though, of course, it's going to go from chaos to coherence, chaos to coherence, which is how our lives seem. But we want to be able to manage that and get in the flow of that so we can transform stress, anxiety, and not get stuck in those incoherent states. What would be the practices to manage stress and anxiety in HeartMath Institute, or I should say in HeartMath techniques? There are many techniques that all are for that because they're teaching you just different things. Like we have a technique, which I can share with everyone, called quick coherence. Get your heart rhythms into coherence quickly, and that releases stress. It helps minimize it in the moment. You can do it with your eyes open or eyes closed. But we know with all the hot heart math techniques, they've been scientifically validated, meaning we've hooked enough people up to sensors in the lab to know it works. And there's a heart math technique for meditation called the heart locking, where you're really deepening your experience of love and coherence and radiating that out to others because the heart's electromagnetic field also transmits what you're feeling. We call it picking up each other's vibes. And then there's coherent communication. How do you use heart coherence to improve relationships and communication? There's a technique for accessing your heart's intuitive guidance where we started. How do you get clear with a heart math technique to make, to have to know in, inside and feel, ah, that's the right decision. And then, step into it, act on it, and have life confirm that. That's very powerful. And there's other techniques too, but that gives you uh, a few. Can we buy those sensors to use in our house? Oh, yeah. The inner balance sensor, and then you can go to heartmath.com and learn about it. Just to ask you, is it really safe to use those kind of sensors on our body? Well... This is a wired, you can get a wired sensor that plugs into your smartphone and the, it, then it clips so as an ear clip on your earlobe. And that's a very sensitive place to pick up your heart, beating heart rate and heart rhythm. So that is fine. We also have a Bluetooth sensor that works with Android or iOS devices and some people love Bluetooth. Everything's Bluetooth these days, but some people don't. And so that's when we can get the wired sensor. We also have a handheld M-Wave about the size of a credit card. And that also has wired sensor that clips to your earlobe. And we have a desktop version that can store a lot of data and has games in it that operate on your heart coherence and train you in a fun way into coherence. And all those operate with the feet, ear sensor wired sensor unless you get the Bluetooth. But all of these are home units or doctors have units called the M-Wave Pro in their offices. And it's a wonderful training tool because you can't fool yourself. You may think you're practicing mindfulness or meditation <laughs> in your head, or you may be so relaxed that you're not coherent. Coherent is a state of present, being present, clear, relaxed, but alert and energized. And that's the high-performing state. So you can see when you're there and there's guides on the, on the Interbalance uh, app for Android or iOS that you can uh, use to help, you know, to guide you in the process. Can we achieve coherence through meditation or any other mindfulness practice? If you're in your heart, you can. That's the key. You know, the heart math techniques and our discovery is that the heart has to be open for coherence. You can do breathing exercises that 
bring the autonomic nervous system into more of this coherent state, but it's hard to hold that without feeling love, care, compassion, kindness, the feelings that of the heart that put you in coherence. And then you can forget about even having, am I breathing at the right rhythm? Because gratitude and appreciation are two of the easiest heart qualities that'll bring you into coherence. So any type of mindfulness, meditation, prayer, that helps activate your heart qualities and where you feel it, not think it, of love or care, compassion, appreciation, gratitude, they will put you in coherence. If I understand correctly, you are saying that even if we meditate for a long time, it doesn't mean that we are living in a coherence state. That's true. I mean, before I actually met Doc Childry, the founder of HeartMath, I knew there were, the heart was important. And I did some heart meditations. But I also had been a 20-year meditator at that time. Wow. I wrote a book called Meditating with Children as my PhD thesis. And that book was a bestseller in the 1970s. And I, but I was focusing on the third eye, which you can have experiences there. It can take you out of the body and into different realms. But then I would go home and, or be at work and react and be stressed by what someone said. Or It didn't always translate into day-to-day -day harmony or flow. And so to have that, you really need to have a higher intelligence prompting you when you're about to say something that could create stress for yourself or someone else and then backwash on you. And I found that meditation by itself didn't do that. But being able to see when I'm in coherence, whether I'm meditating or just sitting in my heart, loving my pet. It doesn't matter. It starts to tune you to what that coherent, present, heartfelt state is. That's more like meditation and action, where you really are much more aware. You know, that is enlightening. And coherence helps us achieve that. If, as a listener to this podcast, I'm thinking... I find challenging in meditation. So what should I do? Should I go for meditation or coherence techniques or should I go with both? Well, I would start, I mean, the heart locking technique is a type of heart meditation. I would suggest you get the heart math experience, go online and get it. I don't know when this program is going to air, but during the COVID crisis, we have been giving it away for free. So we want to get it to as many people as possible so they can manage their stress and anxiety. So I start with that, and I would get the inner balance sensor. Go to heartmath.com and get that. And just use those two to start with and see how that feels, like the heart lock-in technique is a heart meditation. And then do that before you do your other meditations and see how it changes it. And use the technology to see what gets you into heart rhythm coherence easiest. Be a self-scientist, in other words. That's what we encourage everyone to do. <laughs> in, in your book, you also mentioned that people who live in resentment, who are not forgiving to others, they, have, they don't have coherent heart rhythms. Why does it happen? Well, over time, we can develop habits that aren't just physical habits like overeating or, you know, whatever our habits are, <clears throat> exercise habits. We develop emotional habits. And emotional habits get stored in our amygdala and our cells. And they affect how our nervous system responds. And so it can be very challenging at first if you're, stress, depress, you're so strong habit of that to actually feel your heart and feel yourself move into heart coherence. That's why training with the technology really helps. 
We train children as young as four or five, some of them who've been real shut down through abuse, all the way to people who've been 30-year meditators with wide open hearts. You can always improve your coherence level once you know what's going on. You gain more ability, and we have techniques for children and adults. So it's something that's trainable for anyone, but the more hearts shut down, the little more effort and practice we need to get coherent. I would like to say, uh, Dr. Deborah, you remind me of Dr. Joe Dispenza. He talks about coherence all the time. Joe, Dr. Joe is a dear friend, and he, if you read his book, Becoming Superhuman, he honors heart math as being the foundation of a lot of his work. I listen to him every single morning. <laughs> uh, he's a good friend, and yes, we've done research with him, and he's taken heart math and the coherence practices of the heart to elevate the emotional state and the mental state and the heart-brain synchronization we talk about to help people get into some of the higher brainwave spiritual states. Do you have any favorite heart math technology app that you use every day? I use the inner balance every day I, with my iPhone. And I love it because I go deep in my heart and my meditations and with my heart tools, heart techniques. And I like seeing what increases my coherence score all this, or what takes it away because it's so easy to drift. <clears throat> and there's, you can listen to audio tones with your eyes closed that change if you drift. Or you can see, wow, did, why did my score suddenly shoot up? You wonder to a seven, eight, or nine, and you can then feel that place in your heart and that heart-brain alignment that took you there. And so then you want to stay there, and you keep anchoring that in, and it's very pleasant. So you can shift your feeling state on demand and then build more of that feelings that you like as you practice with the inner balance. So that's why I use it in my morning prep for work every every day, and I use it in my 30-minute heart lock-in meditations whenever I can. I love all these practices and technologies. Personally, I'm going to buy some of these technologies for sure, and I will put these links in the show notes. Yeah. Somebody would be asking, we are talking about heart rhythm, but why we need to increase our heart rhythm? What is going to happen? Well, there's you're, you're increasing two things. First of all, Heart rhythm is measured by what's called heart rate variability, which is a measure of the variation of heart rate, beat to beat to beat to beat. So you can feel or take your pulse and think your heart rate is 60 beats or whatever per minute. But it's actually changing with every single beat up and down. So it could be 45 beats, 70 beats, 50 beats, 65 beats. The average is the 60 beats per minute. Heart rate variability is a beautiful metric because it actually plots those B2B changes over time. And that's what gives you the heart rhythm pattern. What's the rhythm of that heart rate variability? And when you, that's what you see on the inner balance technology. If you get one, you see the change, you see the rhythm over time. And as long as you're hooked up on the sensor. And what is very interesting is you want to increase the smoothness of the rhythm. That's the coherence of the rhythm. When you're stressed, those beat to beat changes will be really jagged and irregular about like you feel inside. And when you're in your heart, open hearted, feeling love or kindness, it doesn't matter for who or what. Remember the time you pet your pet and feel that feeling of your puppy dog or your bunny rabbit? You're <laughs> in coherence and it's love. And so and it becomes real smooth, rhythmic pattern up and down. And so you want to increase coherence and it trains you how to do that and it has points and gamification and rewards as you go to each new coherence level. Now, you also want to increase what's called the amount of heart rate variability. And that's like the peaks and troughs of this rhythm pattern because that indicates how flexible your heart is and your emotions are too, meaning you want to have a lot of heart rate variability 
so that the heart rate can go to 120 if you need to get up and run. <laughs> come right down to 50 or 60 if you need to relax quickly. Children have the most flexibility and heart rate variability, and it reflects how healthy you are. There's been numerous studies, not ours, but we reference them a lot, linking low heart rate variability for your age with all-cause mortality. Then low heart rate mindfulness come into this picture into relaxation stress response yeah the relaxation is a wonderful state we all need to relax but that's one part of the heart rhythm is relax the other part of the flow is presence because relaxation by itself is not a high performing state when i run a a board meeting, I don't want everyone sitting around the table just, you know, I, I don't want them stuck in their heads, in their egos either. I want them present, awake, open-hearted, connected in their hearts and clear, coherent. And so that's why we practice these coherence techniques and technology just for a few minutes before all of our business meetings to get everybody coherent within themselves and more coherent with each other. So mindfulness is a wonderful, important part of this because mindfulness, the two things that highlight from the mindfulness practices is learning not to get hooked into your emotional reactions as much or judgments. You're learning how to be more of the observer and allow stressful feelings and thoughts to move in and out without getting hooked or judging them. That's really important for staying present and for creativity and productivity and for stress management. It's also an important part of the heart math techniques is learning how you can use heart focused breathing and activating a heart rhythm coherent feeling that can help you sustain that objective state longer, help you be able to rise above a lot of the potential stressors that could get you. So it's really important. That's, and then mindfulness is also focuses on loving kindness, meta meditation. So you're in your heart. The science behind that, whether they know it or not, the ancient Buddhists did who developed this, is that it gets you heart coherent. Loving kindness in the heart, breathing through the heart area, gets you coherent so that you can be more mindful, more observant. So heart math has just validated the science and takes it to deeper techniques that you can use day to day. How much does sleep help in, in living a better life or living a high performance life? Sleep? Oh, sleep is essential because it is actually balancing a lot of your rhythms, your circadian rhythm, sleep rhythm, your body's hormonal rhythms, I mean, metabolic rhythms. They find that people who don't get enough sleep actually can gain more weight. And the heart rhythm is the master rhythm in the body. It is more powerful than any of the other rhythms, can be measured several feet outside the body with a magnetometer or through the electromagnet field of the heart, whereas the brain rhythms can only be measured maybe an inch or two from the head. And as the heart rhythm goes, it entrains the body's other rhythms. So when you're in heart rhythm coherence, it entrains your alpha rhythm, your blood pressure rhythm, other rhythms into a synchronized state. And it actually helps renew and regenerate you, your nervous system. So when you're in deep, restful sleep, your heart rhythm naturally goes into a more coherent mode. But you want to have that same deep heart coherence, but being totally awake and present while you're awake. So you relax, but you're ready. And that's a high-performing state. That's the first level of the zone of entering into that 360-degree awareness that enables you to have quicker reaction times, respond appropriately, but all in a flow. How many hours do you sleep usually? Oh, it varies person to person. I'm not one of those that says somehow you're more aware or healthier if you get fewer hours sleep. Everybody has their own sleeping rhythm and it can change. 
right now with all the changes happening in the world, there's a lot of chaotic energetics in the energetic field of the planet. What that's doing is it's disrupting a lot of people's sleep rhythms. And a lot of people are reporting that it's hard to fall asleep or they wake up in the middle of the night and can't get back to sleep or they just are up all night laying in bed but can't really fall asleep. And that can happen one night, do that, feel that, and next night you sleep soundly. There's a lot of global rhythms that if you're sensitive can affect your nervous system. That's why for me, I find that I tend to work best, do best, if I get about seven hours of sleep. And then people vary. Some need more and some need less. I would like to ask you, whenever you go to board meetings or you're running a big thing, do you have any practice that you do before entering into that venture? Yes, we all do what we call quick coherence. And it's a one-minute practice. Sometimes we sustain it for two or three minutes. Usually we'll put a little timer on and maybe let's do a two-minute or a one-minute or three-minute, depending on how much time we have and how ruffled anybody's been beforehand from a previous event. And then we'll do three minutes. But it's the whole thing is to neutralize and reset whatever has happened before so you can be fully engaged in the now. And in quick coherence techniques, you talk about heart focus based, heart breathing based techniques. Yes, they're all heart. They all start with the same step. Do you want me to lead you, everybody through one right Please. now? Please. I love it. All right. So, First step is to shift your focus attention away from the mind motions to the center of your chest in the area of the heart. When we do heart focused breathing by keeping our attention there, and pretending like the breath is flowing in through the area of the heart and out through the area of the heart. Breathe a little more slowly, a little more deeply than usual. Find an even rhythm that's comfortable. Now as you continue heart focused breathing, at that smooth even rhythm, activate a genuine feeling of appreciation or gratitude for something or someone in your life. It could be a pet, a loved one, a time in nature, an accomplishment, something that you really can easily feel grateful or appreciative of. So you put your heart into it, into that genuine feeling. That's the activator. That's the metaphor becoming actualized. As you continue breathing in that coherent rhythm. And that's what we do at the beginning of all of our meetings for a minute. And sometimes we'll just say, let's appreciate each other for a few breaths. And you want to really feel it because it's a genuine feeling that increases your coherence. That is so awesome. Can I ask you, what are you appreciative of today? <clears throat> today? Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. I'm appreciative of a lot of things. I'm appreciative of you and the opportunity to share. Thank you. <laughs> and that's important. I'm appreciative of all the people in my workplace who are practice these tools together because this is what we give to the world and we want to make sure that it, we, not even, it's an honor to be able to do them ourselves and, and see all the benefits we've gotten in our relationships, our health, our meditation practices. And just passionate with mission to share the science-based methodology for happiness and fulfillment and health with everybody. So I'm appreciative of the mission that I'm on and the heart. I'm appreciative that we have a heart. And it's more than a pump, and though that's amazing in itself and a miracle. But it's what connects us with 
our higher potential. Call it your higher self, larger self, source, spirit, whatever you want to call it. It's something bigger than the personality and what the personas of each. And it's what connects us all together in the oneness. And that's where true creativity and true high performance can happen. And I'm just delighted that we're mapping out the pathways and helping people become who they really are. That is so amazing. I would like to ask you, is there any difference between being appreciative and being in gratitude state? It's interesting that you ask because there's slightly different frequencies. Sometimes when I activate a positive renewing emotion in step two of quick coherence, sometimes I want to act, feel gratitude. I feel grateful for life or it's it's a receiving state for me you know grateful it's almost graceful and when i'm appreciative it's more of a radiating and projecting and outgoing and appreciate you I appreciate the sun the nature so i think it's for me my experience is that they're both textures of the same thing of thankfulness but they have slightly different tones, slightly different frequencies. But that's me. That's how I relate to it. <laughs> that is amazing. I didn't know up until now that there is any difference because we use these words interchangeably whenever we feel like. And I use them interchangeably. But you ask me, and sometimes they feel a little different to me, but they're both wonderful. Awesome. I would like to ask you, what books have inspired you in your life, apart from your own books? That's a good question. <laughs> it's been a while since I've actually read books. Mostly the books I'm reading are the ones that people send me wanting me to endorse. And, or, and I don't do that anymore because <clears throat> I don't want to do it for one and not for another. But I'm, I'm more inspired by movies or documentaries that I see based upon true stories where somebody has you know, become, somebody's done something where they've really um, transformed. They've changed their lives. They've become more empowered. They've taken care of others. They express the power of the heart. Those are the things I like uh, that, that inspired me. And a lot of it is movies that are based on true stories. Do you watch news? I'm just going <laughs> to have to keep up with it. But I'll tell you what I like. <laughs> on the cable news, not cable, but like the main channels, they end, they're ending their news briefs these days of all the terrible news that could stress you out if you let it. I send compassion. I watch the news as an opportunity to send heart and compassion and care to the stressful situations. That keeps me in balance and it's also energetically helpful to others. So I do that and at the end of the news, so often they say, it's not all bad news, here's some good news or an inspiring segment. And it's you know a child who's given all their piggy bank to the homeless, something that lifts your spirit and I enjoy that. What are you most excited about in the upcoming years? <clears throat> well, I feel the planet is going through a huge shift. It is. And even though it's going crazy with one consecutive major stressor after the other, I see it through the lens of progress and opening up and people realizing that stress and crisis often is what brings you to the heart. Like happened in the coronavirus epidemic here, there was so much care for neighbors and love and kindness and appreciation for the frontline workers expressed. There's a big heart opening as well. And people like that. They said, you know, I don't want to go back to the old normal. There's something connect meaningful about this. There's something fulfilling. There's something that this is what we're supposed to be like is people with each other. And so I see that growing and growing. There's a big movement an awakening of heart. It's not completely apparent yet, but I see it and I see that's only going to keep increasing. 
And that's going to make us more intuitive, more intelligent. We, we call heart intelligent, more connected, more forgiving. And it's actually inspiring a lot of the uh, protests. Black, it's time for equality. Enough is enough. It's time to care. It's time to put the separations behind us and work together. And we develop resiliency through heart intelligence and intuitive intelligence. Absolutely. Well, we work a lot with, you would be surprised, in self-regulation techniques and coherence training with the U.S. military. And the Department of Defense adopted HeartMath Institute's definition of resilience. Also work with law enforcement in helping with self-regulation techniques and tools so they can manage their reactions. And it's resilience isn't just the ability to bounce back. It's building a reservoir of energy so that you have more in your gas tank when challenges come up and you can deflect them. You can move through them with more poise and awareness. So lack of resilience comes when we're running around or walking around depleted and we haven't renewed ourselves. And sleep sometimes doesn't even renew us emotionally. It really does take emotional resilience by learning to manage our energies and go back to the heart to restart. It's like we can't drive a car on an empty tank. We have to have a full tank. Well, your heart is beating full time and it's there for you. It's your best friend. Now that you know it's more than a pump, it's you ask a child, who they are, point to themselves, they point to their heart. They don't point to their head. Their center of being, that's our source. That's where we draw sustenance and resilience from. What challenge do you see, or I, I should ask you, what challenge have you seen in your lifetime while working with people to develop heart intelligence? The biggest challenge is society's training that we should live from the head up. You know, the biggest challenge is helping people make that shift to the heart, even to focus there. A lot of people have shut their heart down because of pain, and it's essential to reopen it to have this connection, to get coherent. And the beauty of the technology is that it gently helps you reopen your heart. And that's what people need. So my biggest challenge, our biggest challenge, is the naysayers who either won't even try it, won't even read the research, don't believe it, write it off, or the ones who do try it and and don't really make the shift to the heart. You know, they get stuck in their head. So that's why the science has been so important. Because when we do a training program and show people, here's the science of how the heart, brain, nervous system communicate not just from Hartman Institute, but from, you know, the Mayo Clinic and, you know, other references, other research studies. And in order to activate this, getting in sync with yourself, getting inner balance, getting coherent, being able to transform stress and not just cope with it, you have to shift to the heart. If someone is attending any therapist, any mental health professional, can we still use HeartMed technologies? Oh, of course. I mean, most of our clients in our HeartMed Interventions clinical online certification program and our HeartMed clinical program for CE credits, both of those, 90% of, our, of the mental health professionals are using this. Sure, there's other physicians and clinics, but we have over 20,000 mental health professionals who use heart math methods in working with patients for their own self-care and with their patients. And they're the ones encouraging their patients a lot to come to heartmath.com and purchase the inner balance for home use. And then they send their results, their baseline and their progress reports to their doctor through our heart cloud. And that's where you'll see a lot of stories in transforming stress in all of our books of people saying, my gosh, in a short period of time, 
uh, a lot of improvements happen in physical stress as well as emotional and mental stress. Do we have these technologies available in different countries, like in India? Yes. I don't know who's distributing there, but they are there. And uh, they're in China and they're in South America. The duty, in, the import duty makes it hard for a lot of the people to afford it. They're in Europe and Australia, of course, United States and Canada. Got it. And this is super exciting. I'm definitely going to get into that. And before I ask you my last question, I would like to ask you, is there anything that you used to believe in your past, but now you don't believe that anymore? Yeah, a lot. You know, you <laughs> grow up, your perception, your mindset, your beliefs change. I'd have to really ponder what I'm going to, you know, which one would be beneficial to share. Anything that comes to your mind? I think what comes to my mind is not so much a conceptual belief, you know, or religious belief or political belief or something like that. It's more of an expansion of consciousness from thinking you're separate from me or I'm separate from other people or more important than someone else or less important. You know, the usual ego vanity stuff that most of us either have born, you know, had from our family or born into or developed over time. But going from that to the real perception and feeling and therefore the belief that we truly are all connected, the experience of that, that our hearts are, are really one, we're connected in the heart. And that's something I, I wasn't aware of. And first I became, I read it in a book, and that, that sounds nice. But to really know it and practice it, that's a different belief. Exactly. Knowing and wisdom, both are different. My last question to you, Dr. Deborah, is what's the legacy you want to leave onto this world? That I live from my heart did everything I could to help other people discover that too, because that's our connection to source, God, whatever you want to call it. And that's what we're all here for. Thank you so much. And that was an amazing conversation with you. Heart to heart, touching conversation with you, Dr. Deborah. Thank you so much. And thank you for your questions. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to this podcast episode today. If you did enjoy this, please subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts or you can visit https colon slash slash nishangarg.me N-I-S-H-A-N-T-G-A-R-G dot me. You can also share this episode with your loved ones to help them live a fulfilled life. You are not alone in this journey. We all struggle in life. There is no shame in talking about it. I go through my highs and lows. I get depressed and these practices help me in living a resilient life. You can also do this. You got this. Don't judge yourself. You are doing the best you can. And thank you so much again.